Good morning. It's book club time. I love book club. It's so fun. <laughs> okay. So I'll say the prayer. And then uh, Jessica had a late night, so she's not going to be on. But I'll say the prayer and read. And it'll be great. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we are very grateful for this day. We're very grateful for our many blessings and for the gospel that can teach us to have peace and have patience and to trust in the process of learning and growth and we are so thankful for for our trials for our um, just everything that we get to learn and, and grow from because we know that our brain wants to run away from them but we know that it's actually for our good and we're grateful that we can push through them and and we pray that we can reach out to each other more often when we're struggling, even though it feels opposite. <laughs> we are grateful for thy loving peace and for for fresh starts every morning. And we're thankful for our families and our children and our husbands and we pray that thou bless us to cherish them. And be able to have patience with them this day and with ourselves. And that we can cherish ourselves as well and just know that we are amazing people that thou hast called. And we love thee so very much. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So, we are on page 172. I think Jessica's book would probably be four, four or five pages after that. <laughs> I'm going to set our timer. All right, let's try to remember where we are. Um, okay, we were just reading about hmm, the escalator elevator situation. And now we're moving on to Joyce Norris, a piano teacher in St. Louis, Missouri, told of how she handled a problem piano teachers, oh, a problem piano teachers often have with teenage girls. Babette had exceptionally long fingernails. I can attest to this. I've had this problem with my students too. This is serious handicap, or this is a serious handicap to anyone who wants to develop proper p um, piano playing techniques. Because you can't like, you have to like keep your fingers straight. It doesn't work. Mrs. Norris reported, I knew her long fingernails would be a barrier for her in her desire to play well. During our discussions prior to her starting her lessons with me, I did not mention anything to her about her nails. I didn't want to discourage her from taking lessons. And I also knew she would not want to lose that which she took so much pride in and such great care to make attractive. I did not take this approach. I was like, you're going to take this. <laughs> but I like to learn this. After her first lesson, when I felt the time was right, I said, Babette, you have attractive hands and beautiful fingernails. If you want to play the piano as well as you are capable of and as well as you would like to, you would be surprised how much quicker and easier it would be for you if you would trim your nails shorter. Just think about it, okay? She made a face, which was definitely negative. I also talked to her mother about this situation, again mentioning how lovely her nails were, another re negative reaction. It was obvious that Babette's beautifully manicured nails were important to her. The following week, Babette returned for her second lesson. Uh, much to my surprise, the fingernails had been trimmed. I complimented her and praised her for making such a sacrifice. I also thanked her mother for influencing Babette to cut her nails. Her reply was, oh, I had nothing to do with it. Babette decided to do it on her own, and this is the first time she has ever trimmed her nails for anyone. Did Mrs. Norris threaten Babette? Did she say she would refuse to teach a student with long fingernails? No, she did not. I guess I did kind of handle it like that. I do try to start with a positive. Oh, guys, my hair needs some work. I need a shower. <laughs> yeah, when I'm by myself, I just like to, you know, do whatever. I always get to watch the recording and laugh at me. <laughs> okay, she let Babette know that her fingernails were a thing of beauty and it would be a sacrifice to cut them. She implied, I sympathize with you. I know it won't be easy, but it will pay off in your better musical development. Sol Hurok was probably America's number one impresario. For almost half a century, he handled artists, such world-famous artists as Chaliapin, Isadora Duncan, and Pavlova. 
Mr. Hirok told me that one of the first lessons he had learned in dealing with his temperamental stars was the necessity for sympathy. Sympathy and more sympathy with their idiosyncrasies. For three years, he was impresario for Fyodor Chelyapin, um, one of the greatest basos who ever thrilled the ritzy box, box holders at the Metropolitan. Yet, Chelyapin was a constant problem. I'm probably saying that super wrong, but I don't recommend it. So, he carried on like a spoiled child. To put it in Mr. Hirok's own in, inimitable, inimitable, inimitable phrase, he was a heck of a fellow in every way. <laughs> For example, Chelyapin would call up Mr. Hirok about noon of the day he was going to sing and say, Saul, I feel terrible. My throat is like a raw hamburger. It is impossible for me to sing tonight. Did Mr. Hirok argue with him? Oh, no. He knew that an entrepreneur couldn't handle artists that way. So he would rush over to Chelyapin's hotel, dripping with sympathy. What a pity, he would mourn. What a pity, my poor fellow. Of course you cannot sing. I will cancel the engagement at once. It will only cost you a couple of thousand dollars. That is nothing in comparison to your reputation. Then Chelyapin would sigh and say, Perhaps you had better come over later in the day. Come at five and see how I feel then. <clears throat> at five o'clock, Mr. Hirok would again rush to his hotel, dripping with sympathy. Again, he would insist on canceling the engagement, and again, Charlie Pin would sigh and say, Well, maybe you had better come to see me later. I may be better then. At 7.30, the great basso would consent to sing only with the understanding that Mr. Hirok would walk out on the stage of the Metropolitan and announce that Chelypin had a very bad cold and was not in good voice. Mr. Hirok would lie and say he would do it, for he knew that the only way to get the basso out on, on the stage. <laughs> Dr. Arthur I. Gates said in his splendid book, Educational Psychology, Sympathy the Human Species Universally Craves. The child eagerly displays his injury, or even inflicts a cut or bruise in order to reap abundant sympathy. For the same purposes, adults show their bruises, relate their accidents, illness, especially details of um, surgical operations. Self-pity for misfortunes, real or imaginary, is some measure practically a universal practice. So if you want to win people to your way of thinking, put in practice, be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. I totally fight this because Aiden is like super needy and like wants a lot of sympathy all the time. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to play into that. I don't want to be like, oh, you know. But you know what? I mean, what's it going to hurt? I'm just going to give him more love and then he'll be excited and I'll encourage him to be independent. It's hard though. I'm like, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> all right. Number 10. An appeal that everybody likes. I was reared on the edge of the Jesse James country out in Missouri, and I visited the James farm at Kearney, Missouri, where the son of Jesse James was then living. His wife told me stories of how Jesse robbed trains and held up banks and then gave money to the neighboring farmers to pay off their mortgage mortgages. Jesse James probably regarded himself as an idealist at heart, just as Dutch Schultz, Two Gun Crowley, Al Capone, and many other organized crime godfathers did generations later. The fact is that all people you meet have a high regard for themselves and like to be fine and unselfish in their own estimation. J. Pierpont Morgan observed in one of his analytical interludes that a person usually has two reasons for doing a thing, one that sounds good and a real one. <laughs> the person himself will think of the real reason. Oh, sorry. <sighs> Got under, like, you don't need to emphasize that. But all of us, being idealists at heart, like to think of motives that sound good. So, in order to change people, appeal to the nobler motives. Is that too idealistic to work in business? Let's see. Let's take the case of Hamilton J. Farrell of the Farrell Mitchell Company of Glenolden, Pennsylvania. Mr. Farrell had a disgrun disgruntled tenant who threatened to move. The tenant's lease still had four months to run. Nevertheless, he served notice that he was vacating immediately regardless of lease. These people had lived in my house all winter, the most expensive part of the year. Mr. Farrell said he told the story to the class, and I knew it would be difficult to rent the apartment again before fall. I could see all, the, all that rent income going over the hill, and believe me, I saw red. Now, ordinarily, I would have waded into that tenant and advised him to read his lease again. 
I would have pointed out that if he moved, the full balance of his rent would fall due at once, and that I could and would move to collect. However, instead of flying up the handle and making a scene, I decided to try other tactics. So I started like this. Mr. Doe, I said, I have listened to your story, and I still don't believe you intend to move. Years in the renting business have taught me something about human nature, and I sized you up in the first place as being a man of your word. In fact, I'm so sure of it that I'm willing to take a gamble. Now, here's my proposition. Lay your decision on the table for a few days and think it over. If you come back to me between now and the first of the month when your rent is due and tell me you still intend to move, I give you my word. I will accept your decision as final. I will privilege you to move and admit to myself I've been wrong in my judgment, but I still believe you're a man of your word and will live up to your contract, for after all, we are either men or monkeys, and the choice usually lies within ourselves. Well, when the new month came around, this gentleman came to see me and paid his rent in person. He and his wife had talked it over, he said, and decided to stay. They had concluded that the only honorable thing to do was to live up to their lease. When the late Lord Northcliffe found a newspaper using a picture of him, which he didn't want published, he wrote the editor a letter. But did he say, please do not publish that picture of me anymore? I don't like it. No, he appealed to a, no a nobler motive. He appealed to the respect and love that all of us have for motherhood. He wrote, please do not publish that picture of me anymore. My mother doesn't like it. <laughs> love that. When John D. Rockefeller Jr. wished to stop newspaper photographers from snapping pictures of his children, he too appealed to the nobler motives. He didn't say, I don't want their pictures published. No, he appealed to the desire, deep in all of us, to refrain from harming children. He said, you know how it is, boys. You've got children yourself, some of you, and you know it's not good for youngsters to get too much publicity. When Cyrus H.K. Curtis, the, the poor boy from Maine, was starting on his media... Um, okay, we'll just stop. We'll just stop there. So start when Cyrus H.K. H. K. Curtis. I'm writing the line. It's on page 177. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good day.